ओम ज्ञान निरंजन शलाका चक्षुर नीलिता येन तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः प्रेजेस ऑफ श्री वृंदावन धाम द स्पिरिचुअल वर्ल्ड सिटिंग इन द सिटी व्हिच इज फार रिमूव्ड फ्रॉम वृंदावन इट्स अ लॉन्ग फ्लाइट फ्रॉम न्यूयॉर्क टू दिल्ली फ्रॉम दिल्ली इट्स still some distance to Vrindavan not only physically removed not only is new york physically removed in space from the position that Vrindavan the spiritual world occupies within this planet in the material also in consciousness the consciousness of vrindavan which manifests the sights the sounds and persons of vrindavan are quite different from the consciousness the sights and the sounds and the persons of new york shila prabhupad came here to bring vrindavan sing in the song jaya jaya vrindavan vasi jata jaya all glories to all the residents vrindavan and especially we must offer our respect and obeisance to that resident of vrindavan who wanted to bring vrindavan everyone the order of his most worshipable guru dev was also was a resident of vrindavan he took up the mission to bring the consciousness of vrindavan and planted in this most unlikely of places because the whole material world means opposite consciousness to that of the spiritual world in the spiritual world the consciousness is one of loving service to krishna and this is this kirtan that we just sung is describing loving service to krishna in the spiritual world vrindavan vrindavan means forest there's no forest here. Central the forest and Krishna playing his flute, attracting all the residents of Vrindavan. There's there's no talking. Maybe we are aware of this in spiritual life. There is no talking. There are certain scriptures. Silence is all. There's no talking in the spiritual world because there's only singing. Talking is singing. There's no walking because walking is dancing. And the sounds are the constant sound. It's not that of traffic roaring up and down. The sound of Krishna's voice. This is the spiritual world where the whole atmosphere is overlaid simply with love of krishna which is nothing to nothing like the so called love of this material world where everyone lives simply for the satisfaction of krishna whose name is means all attracted krishna is attracting everyone and krishna is giving himself to everyone and no one thinks my pleasure my comfort how i should be happy my emotional needs my psychological needs my physical needs my financial needs no one thinks of my 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 only how krishna can be what what can we do to increase krishna's happiness krishna is always happy he's giving happiness to everyone but everyone 
Vrindavan is simply thinking, how can we satisfy Krishna? Whereas the material world is based on a different principle. The material world is based on the principle of I, me, and mine. How I can be happy. What I need. How everyone should cooperate to satisfy me to hell with everyone else. Or it may even be that we cooperate with, uh, with others, we help others, humanistic, altruistic activities, but ultimately these are also performed for the sense gratification to Shri Prabhupada. For the sense gratification of the saying that I feel good, I help others, I'm very good. Or that we should all cooperate to live together very nicely so that we can cooperate with each other so that we can mutually advance the cause of our own individual sense gratification. Prabhupada was sitting here and preaching the spirit of the spiritual world teaching Bhagavad Gita during the Vietnam War with the theme or the basis of the background of Bhagavad Gita is that Arjun did not want to fight the Christians of Bhagavad Gita who should fight so many grounds to hear so many grounds for Arjun why you should fight this was not popular in the mid-1960s among the youths of America who were vowed to peace, make love, not war. Vietnam War was going on. And that was it. Why they wanted peace so that they could make love, in other words, have sex. They wanted to peacefully enjoy sense gratification. We should all live together. Imagine all the people who are being born today from all schools. We should simply have peace. Peace so that we can enjoy ourselves uninhibitedly, unrestricted. We're all just enjoy. No one should interfere with us. However, this, however nice this may seem to you, however well intentioned it may be, Srila Prabhupada speaking the Vedic message, speaking the message of Bhagavad Gita, pointed out the intrinsic fault even in the hippies, the utopian ideal. We should all live together peacefully and we should all be happy, enjoying ourselves. Prabhupada pointed out what is the fault the whole civilization, even the so-called dropouts, they didn't really drop out of anything. They just, from a different angle, they wanted to do the same thing, which is to enjoy their senses, to enjoy illicit sex, intoxication, sense enjoyment. So this is the actual cause of all the problems to all, all this, this simply there's so many symptoms of distress in material life birth, death, old age, disease, economic problems, psychological problems, social problems, health problems, economic problems. We think we'll just adjust this way and that way. We'll vote in a new president. He will. This president will adjust things better than the other president, so that we can all enjoy peace and happiness. With plenty of will, improve the economy, and we'll lock up all the criminals and assassinate someone if we don't like it. And this way, we'll all live nicely and we'll enjoy ourselves. But the very spirit that we shall enjoy ourselves is the underlying principle of the material world, the underlying sinful principle of the material world. Because the spiritual world, which is where we're supposed to, 
everything is very sweet, very enjoyable, very pleasant. But no one is thinking how I shall I shall enjoy myself. It's the whole spirit. How we shall satisfy Krishna. And by satisfying Krishna, then automatically we become satisfied. But as soon as we think, I shall be satisfied. Krishna may or may not be satisfied. But first of all, I shall be satisfied. And then maybe we'll satisfy Krishna. And maybe not. But what does it matter about Krishna anyway? As soon as we think like this, then we become eligible or bound to enter the material world where everyone is thinking instead of focusing our consciousness on the center on Krishna we are focusing our consciousness on I, me and mine and as we have billions and zillions, unlimited numbers of tiny imitation gods each one thinking how I shall be happy instead of thinking how we shall cooperate to make Krishna happy. But this is the underlying principle of the material world. And therefore, whatever adjustments we make, however good we think we shall do, how, whatever economic reforms we make, or however much we preach, moral principles, we cannot avoid effect of the laws of material nature, cruel laws. So many innocent people were killed in New Orleans or in the tsunami. Innocent? Who is innocent? We think innocent, but that we are in this material world means that we are in a guilty position. We are all Defenders against the principle of satisfying Krishna. We all want to enjoy separately from Krishna, which from which comes, from which is born the exploitive spirit. As we see others, other persons, other objects, everything we see, we think, how can how can I use it? In every situation, we think. How can I, uh, how can I exploit this situation with my own enjoyment and comfort, or how can I avoid the discomfort which is arising from this situation? At every moment, consciously or unconsciously, we think everything we see. We think, of course, mostly many things we may simply ignore. But if we find that that something, if you're know, walking down the street, mostly we may ignore many things. But if we see something that appeals to, uh, that we think will give us pleasure, then immediately we take notice. That's why the advertisements, they're trying to grab our attention and, and bluff us that if we buy their rubber tires, imitation of artificial rubber tires, or if we buy their toothpaste, or if we buy their insurance policy, that we shall become happier this way they're trying to grab our attention. If there's something something that appeals to us, we'll try we'll, to our sense of gratification. We'll take notice. Oh, this is this something very nice? How can I enjoy this? Or if there's something that uh, we think will inhibit our attempts to enjoy the happiness of this material world. We see that someone is running down the street with a hatchet, lashing out at people. Uh, out of the way, I don't get my limbs chopped off. Or if we, or if there's uh, some fumes, or some big machine is there giving out filthy fumes, we try to avoid them. Well, that's that's horrible. I don't want to breathe that. So we we tr- we take notice. This is something that is that will spoil my comfort or spoil my health or I'll be dangerous so in this way we spend our whole lives observing different objects within this material world and thinking is this good for me or is this bad for me and we accept those things which we perceive as good and we reject those things as bad and we accept things as good based on the idea that 
It's something I can enjoy. It's something that will increase my comfort, increase my security. Or this is something very bad for me. I should avoid this. So in this way, we spend our whole lives uh, in this consciousness. And if we are smart, if we're slick, then we'll try to adjust the circumstances so that everything becomes more favorable to my enjoyment. We adjust ourselves. We, we get into a position by which we can make a lot of money. And then we spend the money to increase our enjoyment. Of course, when we do that, or if we do that, then others will be envious of our having more money, and they'll want to try and take it away from us. We have to spend a lot of money on security systems to stop persons trying to take money that we have earned, to try to stop them from taking it away from us. So in this way, we spend our whole lives forgetting Krishna and trying to make ourselves the enjoyers which is a doomed attempt. Because we can never be the enjoyer of anything. We simply imagine ourselves to be. It's not our dharma or constitutional position. Our dharma as living beings, we are very, very, very tiny beings. We are, we are part of the jigsaw puzzle. We are not the makers of the jigsaw puzzle. We, we have to know where we fit in. We're trying to organize our situation in this material world so that we can make ourselves happy, not understanding that there is, it's, it's not a place for our enjoyment. The whole attempt to enjoy and exploit is misguided. However superficially happy we may be, leave this situation very soon and then go on to another situation which again we try to be happy with again and again and again. So distress is the natural condition of this material world and just as much as unlimited bliss is the situation of the spiritual world so that much the material world is unlimitedly distressful. Of course, there is some happiness in this material world, but it is the pathetic happiness. Just like, for instance, going to sleep, the, the relief of getting free from the distressful situation. Or what's, what's called happiness, uh, sensual enjoyment, that is some kind of sensation which covers over, because it's intense, sensual enjoyment, it covers over the inner feelings of emptiness and distress that we feel. So, sex, driving cars fast, intoxication, these all titillate the senses. They give us some sensation. But it covers over the distress, the fear, the anxiety, emptiness, the dissatisfaction that we intrinsically feel within us. So Srila Prabhupada came here as a resident of Vrindavan to teach people about that land that they really need to go to. So many immigrants passed the Statue of Liberty coming to New York. This is the land of liberty. Liberty for what? The, the liberty to pursue what you want to do. This is so this is in the American psyche. We the idea that everyone should have liberty to as, as much liberty to pursue the individual what he wants to do. So the Statue of Liberty is a monument to the monumental mistake that America was founded on. That everyone should just be free to enjoy themselves. Actually, of course, they originally that freedom was to pursue, for many 
the early immigrants was to pursue a religious path without being persecuted. This idea of liberty gradually became expanded because a religious path means there are, there are so many restrictions. If you're actually going to follow religion, there are restrictions. In the modern age, they've imagined, especially this neo-Buddhism that they've imagined, that it's just you just kind of feel something, you do whatever you like. But actual religion means that there, there are so many self imposed on, on, on restrictions or restrictions that we accept for purification of the spirit. But in the, in the modern America, liberty is interpreted to mean that we, can, we should be free to do whatever we like as much as possible, as long as it doesn't harm us. But we don't know what is harmful. Just like, for instance, they've said, it's, it's considered nowadays an, an ethical principle of modern America that if a man likes to uh, have a sexual relationship with another man or a woman with another man and they're both consenting, then what it doesn't harm anyone, so it's okay. Uh, it may be even illegal for me to say this, I'm not sure what the laws are. So I'm going to speak against this now. So. I know in Shlanda they have signs that we need police. We will not tolerate any homophobia if anyone speaks of Previously it was considered uh, a wrong condition or a depraved condition to be homosexually inclined, but now it's considered that there is something wrong with it. Anything, if you have anything to say against them. So what's right and what's wrong? What is the harm? If they're consenting, it doesn't do anyone any harm. But they don't realize this is sinful. It is doing harm. They're doing harm to themselves. Sinful means because there are laws of the universe. It's not just going on by chance. There are two heterosexual monkeys got together and produced uh, Charles Darwin by chance. And we all came like this. But it's, it's not going on by chance. It's, a, it's another monumentally foolish theory that they're studying science, all the laws and order within the universe and the root cause of it is disorder. Everything comes, wonderful theories, everything comes from nothing. So these, uh, there are laws of the universe, so there are laws of the universe means there are law maker, and it's not just the laws of science, that you can, but there are subtle laws also, the laws of karma. So even, what to speak of homosex, even heterosex, is also sinful, in other words, against the laws of God, if it's not indulged in for a purpose that will advance the cause of the individual's development of God consciousness. Not only sex, everything. Everything a person does, if it's not for the sake of developing Krishna consciousness, God consciousness, for understanding actually who we are, then we may think, it's great, it gives me happiness, but it works against our actual self-interest. So this is why the, the whole of America is based on a mistake, liberty, everyone should be free to do whatever they like. But no, the actual duty of the government is not to arrange facilities for the citizens' sense gratification, but to arrange facilities for their purification so that they can understand that sense gratification is not in our self-interest at all. It is that which binds us in material life. Purification of consciousness is required and it is the duty of the government to arrange for that. It means there may be so many restrictions. In the modern age, people think that restrictions are very bad. 
but restrictions that guide us so that we can uh, act in a manner that is for our actual self-interest. This is, this is required. This is actual human civilization. But they, in their misguided state, they think that human civilization means the pursuit of sense gratification. But this is not human civilization. This is animal life. The animals in the jungle have full freedom to pursue sense gratification without any restriction. Of course, they might get gobbled up by another animal in the course of doing so. But there's no law to restrict them from sense gratification. That's all they think about, to eat, sleep, have sex, and fight with each other. So the human beings, they, they think that we have developed civilization. But what is the civilization? It's going on on the animal principle of how we can enjoy our senses. And the, the big cities of the Western world, we think this is advancement. Advancement in what? In increasing the opportunities for uh, varieties of eating, sleeping, and having sex, and violence. So what is the advancement? It is not at all advancement. It's that, that we think it is advancement is just another symptom of our crass foolishness that we think it's advancement to build huge buildings in which we have offices making pornography and slaughterhouse management and all madness. People don't know. Nativi do swartagating Hidush. They do not know that the actual goal of life is to understand Vishnu, to understand Krishna, to understand our relationship with Him. That we are not meant for our own sins and joy. It never brings any happiness. If actually this society was beneficial, if it was actually bringing the result of happiness, then why so many problems? Why so many social problems, economic, psychological problems, depression, suicide, murder, drug abuse? Drug abuse means so much drug abuse means that a large section of the population are deeply dissatisfied. Because unless unless one is uh, let's put it another way, if one is actually satisfied within himself, then he doesn't need to pop a pill or stick a needle in or sniff some substance to have some altered consciousness. Altered, if one is trying to alter one's consciousness by these artificial means, that means that one is internally deeply discontent. So anyway, as the hackneyed saying goes, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand that the modern civilization is a it's completely failed to deliver what it's supposed to be delivering, which is happiness for one and all. There's so much development, buildings and different kinds of machines, but so much money floating around billions and billions of dollars in New York. Of course, the average New Yorker doesn't see very much of it. Uh, you can get food of all different varieties from all over the world. You can probably get prostitutes from all different colors, whichever sex you prefer, uh, from all over the world. So all varieties of sexual, sensual enjoyment are available, but Everyone's miserable. So, what went wrong? What went wrong is that this is this is the intensification of the whole principle of the material world, which is wrong from the very beginning. Is that everyone here is simply fully dedicated to forgetting Krishna. That is the misfortune. Our own self-imposed misfortune. So Srila Prabhupada came from Vrindavan. We say he came from Vrindavan. Who's been to Vrindavan? So what did you see there? I saw roads and shops. Not like this, is it? Doesn't look like New York. It has an Indian ambience about it. And uh, 
Pigs wandering in the streets. Probably know it's one of the first things we we'll notice. Stray dogs wandering around. And we see many saddles walking around. So that's what we see. But when we say that Prabhupada was a resident of Vrindavan, that doesn't exactly mean what we perceive with our eyes made of flesh and blood. Srila Prabhupada is an eternal resident of the spiritual world. That spiritual world where there's no talking because there's only singing. The spiritual world where there's no walking because there's only dancing. Where everyone is simply centered on Krishna, unlimited blissful love of Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada came to give this to give Krishna. Who is Krishna? How many people are what is this? Hare Krishna, what is that? What is that? Well, Krishna is God. But what do people understand when we say God? What do they say? People have all different ideas. No one knows who is God. Prabhupada came to teach who actually is God. Whatever concepts we may have, people have concepts of God, some, some vague idea of Him as a person, a dispenser of justice. Those who are pious are rewarded by Him. Those who are sinful burn in hell forever. Sends them to hell forever. Or there's some idea of God as being a force or love. Not defined love, just fuzzy love. Love. Not to be defined. Krishna is, Krishna is more than that. Krishna is more than God. Whatever people conceive of as God. God means the supreme, so no one can be more than God. But what our conceptions are of God, Krishna is much, 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 much more than that. Generally, we conceive of God as someone out there somewhere who we... It's like a machine. You push the button and Coca-Cola comes out on ATM. Hit the button and money comes. God give us our daily bread and pay rise and all these other kinds of things. God is someone who benefits us. Is our contaminated consciousness. Everything we see, everything we think of, everything we hear, we process it in our consciousness. How we, how we can use it for my enjoyment. So when we think of God, we think, oh, how can I use God for my enjoyment? He's, he's all powerful. That means He can give me daily bread, happy life, and maybe eternal life, where I can enjoy happily forever. And God will arrange everything for my enjoyment. So Krishna is not that concept. That means we don't know who is God. We don't know. We think He is someone for our enjoyment. But we are meant for His enjoyment. And by serving Him, we actually become satisfied. It's not possible for any other means. So to say Krishna is God is true. But first we should understand actually what God means. An atheist will say, I don't believe in God. You say, which God don't you believe in? We probably don't believe in that God either. The, the God that is propagated by the world's religions, simplistic understanding, that Krishna is not this cosmic order supply. He's the simple point to understand. He is the object of our service. The object of our love. By loving Him, again, even the word love, you know, we have every word we've misinterpreted, misconstrued. Love means giving and serving to one who we fully trust with no personal motive. That is love. But love 
is generally interpreted to mean that I love someone because I I get some good feeling from them. And as long as they can supply that, we call that love. And then the, the attitudes change and then I, I, I don't fell into love and we fell out of love. There was never love. Love is actual love means there's no breakage. There cannot be. Even if there's apparent grounds for breakage, the bond is so strong there cannot be any breaking. So love for God, love for Krishna is completely the opposite of the exploitive spirit of this material world. So this was Prabhupada's great contribution that he came to bring Vrindavan. He is the resident of Vrindavan. He never leaves Vrindavan. He apparently left Vrindavan. But his bond with Vrindavan, Vrindavan means the land of service to Krishna. So when he comes, he brings Vrindavan with him. Thus he converted this storefront into Vrindavan, in as much as the atmosphere of Prabhupada generated here was one of service to Krishna, loving service to Krishna, without any personal desire. And whatever may go on outside is completely different to that. Prabhupada established that atmosphere here. From here, that went all over the world. And we will continue to follow Prabhupada actually. Thus, live in Vrindavan, wherever we may be, if we accept this attitude of selfless service to Krishna, following Srila Prabhupada, who is the resident of Vrindavan. Otherwise, we can go and live in Vrindavan, take a flight to Delhi, and then from Delhi go to Vrindavan by train or taxi or whatever. We can live in Vrindavan, but never actually go there. If there also, we bring the attitude, how I shall enjoy, how I shall become happy. Vrindavan is not just a matter of buying a ticket and going to the spiritual world. There's no ticket we can buy to the spiritual world. But we can, if we purify our consciousness by accepting simply accepting the principle that I am meant to serve Krishna, meant to love Krishna, give up the exploitive atmosphere. I should enjoy this material world. I should enjoy the spiritual world. With any such attitude, then we cannot understand the term. Even if we even if we learn millions of verses and put on Tilak very beautifully and talk so many nice things appear to be in Vrindavan consciousness, but as long as there is the exploitive spirit, I, others will praise me because I'm a great devotee. As long as there's any any slight motive that I should be the center, then we cannot enter Vrindavan. But as soon as our consciousness is how we shall serve Krishna, he should be in the center. I am I am insignificant. Let me not even to think I shall serve Krishna. That is also placing ourselves too high. Rather we should think I shall be the servant of 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 Krishna. Not push myself up. I shall be so good. I shall be so great. Simply let it be the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. So this is completely opposite to materialistic others will say that this is a, a slave mentality. Why should we stand up and assert yourself? Assert ourselves what? Why? How? What? What's the purpose? Become big so Big what? Big shot. Famous, wealthy, powerful. What? We're, with, we're tiny little beings on a tiny little planet with a, our lifespan is just a blip in time. What is this foolishness that I shall make myself happy? We cannot become great. No one's great. George Bush isn't big. Bill Gates isn't big. Big means 
in an ant's nest, one might be more, one ant might be more prominent than another. So what? So like that. What? What is the intrinsic difference between, from the cosmic standpoint, what's the difference between us and ants? We're tiny, tiny little beings, but we think we are very important. I have a lot of money. I'm very important. I'm very powerful, wealthy, famous. I'm very important. What is one ant becoming more important than another? So the, the attempt to be great is foolishness, impossible to do. So rather we should understand our position that we are insignificant, but that our only significance comes from understanding what is our actual position in relationship to He who is actually significant, who is Krishna, and the servants of Krishna. They are significant. They should be served. This is the revolution that Prabhupada came to. Revolution in consciousness. Understanding actually who we are. It sounds horrible. I should become a servant. I should realize myself insignificant. I shall never become great. I should not enjoy. It sounds horrible because we're in diseased consciousness of thinking, I should be great. I should be the center. I should be the enjoyer. But actually this endeavor, I shall be great. I shall be famous. I shall be the enjoyer. What is the result? Everyone is miserable. And in Krishna consciousness, everyone is thinking, I shall be the servant. I am insignificant. Everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. And everyone is blissful. So, what works? Want to be happy? The whole city, the whole material world is dedicated to happiness. Well, this is happiness. Where's your happiness? Amassing money, becoming full of anxiety. So, even if you don't accept this philosophy, still you should jump in Krishna because you should have it. You happy. Who's, who sings in the street without taking intoxication? Is there anyone else? And even that singing in the street of the intoxicated people, that's, that's gaulish. I know, I've been in, in, in central London in the last few nights. Where with the apartment overlooking the place where all the ghostly people assemble at night to take intoxication all night long. <laughs> and this is their enjoyment. They make it, it's just a sample sound. Much louder than that. <laughs> this is a sample of the kind of noises they make to express their happiness which they get from becoming intoxicated. This is their, after working all week, this is their enjoyment. Unfortunately. So devotees of Krishna sing and dance in the streets. So even if you're a complete atheist and you're dedicated to the principle, I want to be happy, then you should join the Hare Krishna. Because you won't find anyone more happy there's a reason for that also. The reason is because devotees, the most intelligent people, they know actually how to be happy. And without doing a, without doing a nine to five job, without working twelve hours a day. Devotees work twenty four hours a day. They don't do any work at all. Because just like in the spiritual world, walking is dancing, talking is singing. So in Krishna consciousness, service or working. Play. Hare Krishna, I'm supposed to give some time for questions. So I'm doing so. How do you feel insignificant and keep serving? What's the, what's the problem? If we think that I'm not significant enough to serve, is that it? No, we're not. We're, we're insignificant, but uh, we're not non-existent. We have some function. We, we are living beings. 
and we have a duty to serve Krishna, we should do that. We shouldn't think, I am doing I am doing such wonderful service, but we should see something. I've been very kindly, my, my spiritual master, who is a servant of Krishna's devotees, has kindly engaged me in this service, and now I'm not fit to do so by his mercy, by the mercy of the Vaishnavas, by the mercy of Krishna, and being engaged in this service. So I should try to do it to the best of my capacity. We should think that uh, we're asked to wash the pots, and then after two hours you come back and say, we wash them. Why didn't you wash them? Well, I'm just expecting that I'm not fit to do this service. That is rascal. To say that. Please take the mic. Yeah, we can say like that. If one desires, to be, if one desires to be rich, one should desire to be rich and use the money in Krishna's service. That's all right. Just to that may be to trick people who don't. It may, just like what I said tonight, tonight may be very difficult for most people to even begin to accept. But if we tell, yes, you be famous, you be rich, but use it all in Krishna's service, that may be more palatable for people to hear. They may be more inclined to accept them. But actually the desire to be anything but the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna is a contaminated desire. So we can think like that, but if if we cultivate that desire, we see actually that it leads to disaster in spiritual life if we don't transcend that desire. And actually, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu warns against that. La puja pratishta jata upa shakaka. He warns it against the, the desires for monetary gain and for honor and to become famous. These are weeds which choke the growing allegorical plant. So, Or we can say that instead of desiring to be famous, if we have such a desire, which we all have contaminated desires, so we sing Ebe Dyosh Gushuk Tribhuva. Spiritual Master, we worship Srila Prabhupada every day with this song. His glory should be broadcast throughout the world. So we can dedicate our lives to making Krishna famous, making our making Prabhupada famous. Prabhupada did that. He came to the Western world and made Krishna famous. Actually, no one knew of Krishna except a few, very few scholars in the university even heard of Krishna. But Prabhupada made Krishna famous. Whereas most of the Swamis came from, actually all of them came from India before Prabhupada or at the same time or after him. They, the, the ones that were so-called successful made themselves famous. Whereas even now, unfortunately, not so many people know Prabhupada, know Krishna, because he didn't promote himself. He never promoted himself. He promoted Krishna. But he became famous. I'm saying not so many people know. But all the demigods, they know. He's famous among all the really important people. And these others, they're famous among the crow-like people. So, famous crows. Desire to become famous, subtle sex desire. Yeah, others will notice me. Who's studying Kabbalah? Is it? She's not 
don't have to be Jewish. Just to study in Kabbalah. What is her study? What is her study? Ah, they take they take it as a hobby. What is study? They're studying Kabbalah means it's just they, 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 everything they do is shallow. If they're actually studying, then they should they should be serious about spiritual life. Why don't they take to Krishna consciousness? Because they're not sincere. Actually, on the plane, someone says, telling me some things about Kabbalah. I just came in. Someone deeply. So, why don't they take to Krishna consciousness? Well, one thing is they may not know. We didn't distribute enough books to share the problem. That may be one reason. Another reason is that uh, one has to be sincere. Sincere means desires to serve Krishna. That desire often comes about on the platform of when one is feeling disgust with material life. That's what I'm saying. Madonna is studying. What is this? Because to actually enter into spiritual life, then one cannot be a gross materialist at the same time. It's not possible. We want to speak in the mic, I can't. To me. You think that reality is adjusted for you according to your opinion? That's nonsense. <laughs> reality does not depend upon our opinion. It's not, I, to me, it's like this. Reality is as it is. We are subordinate to reality. Reality is not subordinate to us. You may understand, but what you think is not necessarily a fact. What we be, usually we think, I understand, I believe, as if reality is subordinate to what we understand or what we believe, but it isn't. It is, reality is as it is. So our duty is to find out what reality is. It doesn't depend upon our opinion. Just like today I may believe, today I believe in God, Tomorrow I don't believe in God. But God's existence or non-existence doesn't depend upon our opinion. So we have to find out what is the actual fact. It's not just to me, I think it's like this. But God doesn't adjust himself to us. We have to adjust ourselves to him. That's not the point that I'm making. I'm making the point that God, or the ultimate principle, or, the, or anything, are principles or facts independent of our opinion of them. Just like, for instance, you may say, to me, 2 plus 2 equals 5. And you can believe it as much as you like. And you can even make a political party based on that principle, the 2 plus 2 equals 5 party. But it's nonsense, because 2 plus 2 equals 4. So similarly, whether or not God exists, and who he is, if he does exist, which actually he does. Who he is, what is our duty in relationship with him, uh, what he does, what he wants of us, that is not dependent upon our perception of him or what we would like it to be. We have to adjust ourselves to him, not that he adjusts according to our whim or our fancy day by day. We are tiny, he is great. That's God, right? God means supreme. We are tiny. We may imagine ourselves to be great, but we're not. So, it's not a matter of thinking, 
I believe like this, or to me it's like that. Or rather we should understand who he is and what he wants of us. <coughs> There's this common idea that you know, everyone can just believe what they like and do. My spiritual path is like this. But that's just, a, that's just another form of what I was speaking about. How we all have, we try to put ourselves in the center. That I shall define reality according to what I think it should be. But rather, we should understand that the ultimate principle, God, actually Krishna, philosophically, speaking the ultimate principle is independent of what we might like it to be so we should rather try to understand what is reality rather than uh, imagining what we might think it might be or even even when you take Kabbalah or scripture we have the tendency to interpret it according to how we would like it to be but that's there, everywhere, all religion it's, it's all religion means what God gives to man so that we can understand him, but inevitably man adjusts it to what he want, what man thinks God should be according to our opinion in which, it, in which case it immediately ceases to be actual religion so our Actual religious duty is to find out what is the ultimate reality and adjust ourselves according to that. That is religion. Rather than uh, imagining what we... having a, a preconception of what we think religion or spiritual life should be and then trying to find our way towards that. Rather we should find out what is reality, what is our relationship, how we fit in. And usually it's quite different to what people imagine it to be. Mostly what people take as religion, it's uh, it either on a gross platform, give us this day our daily bread and sausages and everything else. Or on a subtle platform, that how, how I will feel mystic happiness. But it's the same spirit that God should make me feel happy. Actual religion means to turn around our consciousness and understand that our duty towards Him is to act in a way that we will be satisfied. Spiritual life means to give up the materialistic concept of putting ourselves in the center and considering that whatever we do should give us satisfaction and act for the satisfaction of Krishna. You think, again, you think. <laughs> Who is the arbitrator? It's not my opinion, it's not your opinion. Alright, so let me tell you, I'm not saying it's right, but um, mostly everyone, when they speak truth, they don't have truth. Because everyone is in the illusion, even the so-called spiritualists, of, again, what, what appeals, what we think should appeal to us. Whether it's, if, if, if we've... If we become frustrated enjoying five senses, then we want to enjoy a sixth sense. But actually there is God who is the Supreme Person, who is... Actual love means to surrender all our activities, all our consciousness to Him for His pleasure. Then automatically we feel satisfied. But this idea that ultimate reality is light is just another expression of the same envy of Krishna that incarcerates everyone in this material world, either in a gross way or in a, in a imaginatively spiritual way. Because it's avoiding the principle of surrendering to and serving Krishna. 
we are all in gross material consciousness, we like to engage everything in our own personal sensual enjoyment. And then when we become frustrated with that, we think, okay, turn all that off and I'll just relax or merge into some light. But both are uh, different phases of avoiding the principle that we are tiny beings, we are meant to serve the Supreme Being, loving service. When we give ourselves fully to Him, He gives Himself fully to us. We become completely satisfied. So, this is reality as described in Vedic literatures. There may be other religious literatures which also describe reality in different phases. But, That reality has to be, if it's not, even if the scriptures are taught, if it's taught without the proper understanding of how we are meant for Him, He is not meant for us. Unless this selflessness, this actual lack of egotism is understood, then it all becomes, it's just like you have a nice pot of milk and a little drop of poison, the whole thing becomes poison by that attitude. Lack of egotism. We've heard this, isn't it? That we should have lack of egotism. But the the desire even to merge or understand light independent of the spirit of complete submissiveness to Krishna, that's simply another phase of egotism. Our, our egoism can only be fully uh, overcome when we submit ourselves fully to Krishna. Then we become free from birth and death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, God, please serve God, but you have to find out who He is, how He wants us to serve Him. There's a question at the back there. Could you please give the mic? All right. Which books? Here. Yeah. Um, well, on Prabhupada's order, I've written, and yeah, I want. Did you say selling them or what? Uh, well, these are the books that I've written. I uh, yeah, I, and I wanted to distribute them. Actually. Thank you for reminding me because I forgot all about them. On Srila Prabhupada's order, I'm writing books which are to further the mission that he has described in his books. And those who have Prabhupada's books are invited to take some of these books also. They're available here in English, Russian, and Hindi. Various books. At the back there, yeah. All right, so we'll have some practical. We're not actually interested in arguing and feeding people and all this, but we want to establish what are the actual facts of spiritual life for the benefit of everybody. So all this might be difficult for you to mentally or emotionally address all of us. Let's chant Hare Krishna. Okay, well, if you don't know the mantra, I'll give you a free mantra class. The mantra is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare. And it's very easy. Uh, I'll sing, and then I'll.